Ibig sabihin po ng veterano ay matanda. So, um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, congratulations to the class of 2023. Congratulations. It's such an honor that you have made me part of this ceremony of this key moment in your lives. Maraming salamat po sa UP School of Economics. For the people who make it run, uh, Dean Joy, salamat po. Um, I, I will try to pull all the different thoughts together. It was uh, economics, you know, economics. Well, you are experts today in a field that will give you tremendous visibility onto what really moves the world, right? So. Let me start with this, right? I, I have bad news. And because I'm a journalist, I'm going to start with the bad news. But I hope that I will also give you the good news, right? Because there's a ton. There is a lot. We are living in a time of creative destruction. Uh, I, this really came alive for me, this concept by Joseph Schumpeter, which I'm sure you studied, describes this process of innovation and destruction, change, that leads to the, actually to the falling apart of industries, of jobs, of economic structures. I lived it when I was Jakarta Bureau Chief of CNN in 1997, when the Asian financial crisis hit. And it was first, you know, it came up through Thailand, and then it hit Indonesia. And the rupiah, the currency in, in Indonesia plunged from 2,400 rupiah to the dollar to 14,000 to the dollar in days, right? So what did that mean? That meant that Indonesia's foreign debt, oh yeah, I don't have to tell the, the new economists, I don't have to tell you, the foreign debt soared, it exploded. But for us living in Jakarta, living through that meant that, you know, I could go to the store and buy a computer that used to cost $1,000, and it would only cost $100. And I'd go to the restaurant, and the prices would change every day, sometimes every half a day, and forget the markets, right? It was such a time of literal creative destruction. That micro from the marketplace to the macro, the foreign debt, geopolitical flows of money, of capital. That micro to macro view is what you've learned in economics. As economists, this is your expertise. You now have the tools to take apart power and money, which, as I've learned as a journalist for almost four decades, is what drives the world right? Power and money. That's where every story inevitably goes. As economists, you have a toolbox, skill sets that help you understand the world from a different perspective. You know, we, we now, there's this great book called The Cult of the Amateur. You are not amateurs, you are experts, right? So because you are graduating from the University of the Philippines, I ask, you don't just aim to be a technocrat. Aim higher, do better. Use what you have learned to jump to the front lines of fighting inequality, conquering poverty, and help push for the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, because we're coming at a point where it is existential. Right? Using the scientific method, you work with evidence, with facts, to understand and explain how the world works. You identify patterns and trends, connecting the micro with the macro, with a global view, the factors of production, the drivers of an economy, the inefficiencies, I really love that word because often people use it as a euphemism for corruption. Except, wait, what happens when facts become debatable? 
when technology companies design the platforms that connect each of us, I mean, you would have tweeted or posted your graduation, your diploma, that moment you got your diploma, right? What happens when these platforms that connect us actually try to hack our biology, to manipulate our emotions, fan our fears, our anger, our hate, because there is much to be unhappy with, right? To insidiously manipulate humanity at scale, beyond us, beyond this country, at scale for profit. This is where your work and mine intersect. Some would say that we at Rappler are a cautionary tale for what happens when you stand up to power. Yes, you get singled out. Yes, you get hammered down. There's a phrase in, in Indonesia, you know, the nail that stands up gets the hammer. Yes, you get attacked. Yes, you feel afraid. Yes, you almost go bankrupt. And yes, the government filed 10 arrest warrants against me, eight of them in about three months. And yes, because I kept doing my job, I had to be okay with going to jail. Because I didn't know, right? And while a lot of the cases have been, we've been acquitted, I could still go to jail. So thank you for having me here. <laughs> but here's the but, and this is the best part. You don't know who you are until you're forced to fight for it. That's when the coal becomes a diamond, right? When the pressure is there. So words like values, standards and ethics, we at Rappler stood by these, and we've seen that the world rewards the good. Don't believe the people who tell you, you know, I and daming corrupted, dapat corrupt karen. So that's not the way it is. It doesn't have to be that way, right? When you decide to take a stand against corruption, you find people like you. You don't give yourself an excuse. You see the incredible generosity of strangers. I mean, for Rappler, they helped us pay our legal fees. We couldn't have done it without them because our legal fees blossomed in a year and a half to 50 million pesos. Sino kayang may kaya nun, di ba? So we also saw the courage of so many Filipinos and so many others all around the world who believe in the values and the principles of democracy. Democracy is flawed, it is far from perfect, but it is the best we have so far. Of economists from this school, like Solita Monsad, whose daughter is here, right? And you know, now she's your professor. I hear a terror professor. Um, <laughs> I love her to death. Um, but she not only supported us, she sits on the Rappler board, and she joined us at the time of the worst fear. It is also someone like Noel de Jos, who, well, who was the mentor to his student, J.C. Punung Bayan, Rappler's resident economist. He remained steadfast, steadfastly anchored on the facts and speaks truth to power along with the journalists on the front lines. Lawyers. Did you know that there are more lawyers killed than there were journalists killed under the last administration? He who shall not be named, no, sorry, I will name him, under former President Duterte's administration, more lawyers were killed than journalists, right? Well, so many lawyers offered pro bono help here and around the world. And here's the good part. I told you there were some good parts, right? Uh, you get to meet people like George Clooney, Amal, Sandra O, oh, the mother of dragons, and this very, very tall blonde woman who was 
ahead of me on the red carpet at the time 100. And, you know, she kept stopping, and which meant that I kept stopping behind her. And so we, had, we did a lot of interviews or a lot of photos. And I was wondering why my sister, who was wa walking with me, just like said, kept saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, and was, was videotaping the entire thing. It wasn't until we got to the end of the red carpet that um, we, she introduced herself. It was Taylor Swift. <laughs> I know her music, guys. I'm not that old. Um, but I just didn't know who she was. But if you ask me who terrorists are, I know their faces, right? Expertise. So, you know, oh, the best part of standing up for what you believe, of, of having the courage to hold the line, you get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Rappler is a Nobel newsroom, and really, I haven't done anything differently. My news group hasn't done anything differently from those standards and ethics that have always been there. We just stayed the course, right? Because we stayed true to our values, ah, well, because we stayed true to our values. So, okay. Let me lay this out so you can see what the new factors of production are. Because this is some of the reasons I keep speaking in different parts of the world. There are new factors of production and how human beings have been commoditized and why we've gone beyond creative destruction. And now we can actually face extinction. I told you I have bad news. Okay. Um, you heard climate, right? June was the hottest month ever in the, in the history of the world. We'll come to that. We still have all the old world problems to solve, bricks and mortar factors of production, of governance, of conflict. But the game changer is data. It is big data. When you have data coming at you in the way we have it today, it's like genetic um, technology, like CRISPR technology, which you can basically customize a baby today, right? But we put guardrails around this technology. Well, what are we talking about here with big data and information? This, this idea that data is the new oil has been around for a while but it's gotten significantly worse. Because the prize, what is being commodified, is you, your attention, the attention economy. And it has a new business model. We didn't even have a name for that business model until 2019, when Shoshana Zuboff, Harvard professor emeritus, published her book, and she named it Surveillance Capitalism. This touches every single one of us. The last time human beings were commoditized in this way, I mean, really, I suppose the very first time, the slave trade, but the last time was labor, right? Physical. It was our physical labor. That was during the age of industrialization. So what happened? We had sweatshops. We had child labor. We had labor coming together, industrialists, who realized that they could create a factory line and make a lot more money make, because they can make a lot more products. Production was faster. That exploited the people who were on those factory lines. We certainly know this, right? It was the age of the robber barons in the United States. Um, you know their names, Carnegie, Rockefeller. What happened then? Well, labor came together people came together, and they formed unions to fight for their rights. Society came together to protect ourselves, and governments began to create laws to stop these unfair labor practices. What did those robber barons do? They donated to education, a lot of money, right? Who are the new robber barons today? You'll see in almost everything that I say publicly, I point to the CEOs of these technology companies involved 
in surveillance capitalism. When our atomized personal experiences are collected by machine learning, organized by artificial intelligence, extracting our private lives for outsized corporate gain, like a license to print money. Highly profitable micro-targeting operations are engineered to structurally undermine our will, human will. It undermines this. And in the Nobel lecture in 2021, I called it a behavior modification system in which we are Pavlov's dogs, experimented on in real time, and the consequences are disastrous. It's almost like you have a drug company that says, on that side of the hall, I'm gonna give you drug A, and this side, I'm gonna give you drug B. Let's test it, I think it's gonna be good. Oh, the people who tried drug A died, so sorry, and nothing happened. There was no accountability, right? So think about this like this. How many of you have cell phones? Raise. Please raise your hand. Do you have cell I'm I am positive you all. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone here not have a cell phone? All of us have cell phones. Very good. <laughs> um, who's on Facebook? Please raise your hand. Wala na kayo sa Facebook. <laughs> We're still there. Um, Instagram. Sino nasa Instagram? Sino nag-insta na ngayon? Um, and then Twitter. Do we have... I know you're on Twitter. We're X. X na pala. Sorry. <laughs> X na. Elon Musk, our CEO, Robert Barron. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So here's... For every post you do on any one of these social media platforms, machine learning takes every post you take. JC posts a lot. So it takes that, and then it creates a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself because it has all your relationships. It has everything you have ever posted. It has, if you're on the dating app, it knows who you like or don't like. Um, and if you're in the marketplace, it knows what you buy, right? So what happens if you replace, they use this machine learning to, to take that model of you and then artificial intelligence comes in and takes all of our models and makes that the mother load database. That's what's used for micro-targeting. But replace the word model, which sounds it's like inefficiency. It's not quite re the right word. Replace it with clone, okay? So they say, because we used machine learning, we own your clone. Did you give permission to, to have them own your clone? We didn't, no, because they never asked. And if they did, could you get paid? Technically, you should. This should be a bargaining thing, right, in an economy, because they took something from us, and we should get something in return. They say, it's well, it's just because you get this free service. Uh, that's not really true. So Mark Zuckerberg put a value to each one, and, and the people who, who know this actually said the value is very low, but he said that our clones, your clone is worth about $17 for every three months. Okay, uh, then maybe they should pay for it. Here's the part that's interesting. One clone is $17, but 100 million clones gains much, much more value in aggregate. The larger the data set, the more valuable it gets. So what's the value of your clone in this huge data set? Engagement-based metrics of these tech companies mean that the incentive structure of the algorithms, and what's an algorithm? It's just opinion in code, right? An algorithm is a machine that's been programmed opinion in code. It's implemented at a scale that we could never have imagined. It's, it's, it is insidiously shaping our future by encouraging fear, 
anger, hate, lies, the worst of human behavior, right? So in 2018, MIT published a study that said lies spread six times, at least six times faster than those really boring facts that you had to memorize, right? That we had to memorize. So lies spread faster, and if you lace it with anger and hate, it will spread even faster. Those, well, all of this is data that we've found in Rappler. We found here in the Philippines. And these ne next three sentences I have said over and over again since 2016. I really felt like Cassandra and Sisyphus combined. Um, and I said it at the Nobel lecture. I will say it to you again, just in case you didn't hear me before. Ang kulit, no? Sasabihin ko siya ulit. If we don't have facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these three, we have no shared reality. We can't work together because we can't even admit what the problem is. We cannot have democracy. Journalists, human rights defenders, anyone under attack, we are defenseless against this information warfare because that's what it is. And at this time, the move for profit, a lot of money, and authoritarians using this technology to consolidate power, these align. Um, last year, VDEM in Sweden said that 60% of the world today in last year was under authoritarian rule. This year, this January, that number went up to 72%, right? So 72% under authoritarian rule. The same methodology is used all around the world, and we saw it here in the Philippines. It's strange. The two biggest stories of my career were 9-11, the 9-11 attacks when these, the, the airplane crashed into the building. That was actually in the 1995 interrogation report of someone arrested here in the Philippines, probably the first pilot recruited by Al-Qaeda. His name was Abdul Hakim Murad. So it was an attack against the US, but they were testing it out in the Philippines. The second biggest is information warfare, right? And we were tested. We were the guinea pigs. America was the target. In the Cambridge Analytica scandal, Americans were the most compromised accounts, but the country with the second most number of compromised accounts was us here in the Philippines. So we're the testing ground. The same methodology is used everywhere around the world, and if you've been attacked online, it's the same, you know this. Bottom up, exponential attacks on social media. In my case, it was at least 90 hate messages per hour pounding a lie a million times that becomes a fact. And then that comes top down from the president in our case. In our case, the meta narrative that was seeded is journalist equals criminal. So that was pounded a million times bottom up. And then a year later, President Duterte in his State of the Nation address in 2017 said the exact same thing. A week after that, we got our first subpoena and then the Arrest warrants came, 14 investigations in 2018, and then in 2019, all the arrest warrants. In my latest book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, I showed where we first saw this information warfare globally, right? Where was the first impact in the world? It was in 2014, and it was Russia seeding meta-narratives to annex Crimea, kind of these these meta-narratives that said, you know, it is, it's Nazism that is there, the Crimea needs to, you can see this come out on Twitter. In fact, I got some of them here. In the, first, in the prologue of the book, you saw the same thing, pound and suppress the facts, to silence the facts, then replace it with a meta-narrative that they wanted. That becomes the new reality. That meta-narrative is the same one that was used eight years later by President Putin to invade Ukraine itself. Now we have our first conventional war 
in decades. 2014 was the year. That was also the year we saw information operations that literally changed Philippine history. Transforming the name Marcos on social media first from a kleptocrat to the greatest leader the Philippines has ever had. Uh, it truly, in plain sight, made me really think about what Milan Kundera said. He said, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. We can erase it. We can have multiple realities. This is what technology says. Technology says each one of us can have our own reality, and we are all right. That's not correct in the public sphere, because the reality is that there is no difference between the online world and the real world. Physical and virtual, there's the same person that is in both. There is only one world. Online violence is real world violence. And here's the thing we have all come to learn. If you can make people believe lies are facts, then you can control them. In my Nobel lecture, I said that an atom bomb exploded in our information ecosystem. And because we need to prevent humanity from doing its worst, we need laws to protect us. This isn't a freedom of speech issue. It's a safety issue. It's an engineering issue. These tech companies, the new gatekeepers into our public sphere, is the least regulated globally. Cambridge Analytica whistleblower Chris Wiley, he came to the Philippines and we just did an event with him in May. He reminded us that a toaster has far more safety regulations that it has to pass before it gets in your home. Far more than the software that we carry with us in our phones. All of us do that, right? So the platforms want you to debate content moderation because if you're stuck at content moderation, they make more money. You know this, deflect. Um, algorithmic amplification, the operating system, that's where we need to go further up. And then we need to go even further upstream to the root cause, the business model, surveillance capitalism. That's where safety, privacy, antitrust, content moderation, that's where it all connects, right? These are not separate issues. Um, here's the thing, I think of our information ecosystem like a river, and content moderation, fact-checking, is like taking a glass of water from the river, cleaning it up, dropping that tablet that cleans up the water, and then dropping it, throwing it back into the river. What you need to do is you have to go up to where the pollution is coming from, where the lies are coming from, and stop that. That's where the laws need to come in. And then we can begin to rehabilitate that public sphere, the river that runs through all of us, right? Okay, so at the end of April, I was actually with, um, I kicked off an event in Oxford. Uh, I talked about many of these same issues. And then the man who followed me was Al Gore. And he said that, you know, well, he talked, of course, about climate change. He's been talking about it for decades. This month, he, he pointed out, and that was already then, was the hottest on record. What he said on stage was that you cannot solve the climate change crisis until you solve the democracy crisis. And you cannot do that until you fix the information ecosystem. I became a journalist because information is power. If it manipulates our biology because of the design, that needs to stop. We cannot solve global existential problems if we don't win the battle for facts, right? How do we do that? It's an economic problem. This is right in your wheelhouse. This is what you need to fix. But, more but, it's about to get worse. AI, 
artificial intelligence, which has already beaten humanity at the first contact, right? The machine learning in social media, creating cascading failures that has turned our politics all around the world into a gladiator's battle to the death bringing with it a whole slew of social harms that we have yet to fix. If you're a woman, LGBTQ, if you were marginalized in the real world, you were further marginalized online. This is part of what a whole group of Nobel laureates came together to ask, that this coded bias be stopped. But here's the other part. Globally, we are electing illiberal leaders democratically. Because if we don't have integrity of facts, we cannot have integrity of elections. We didn't learn from the first time we rolled out social media, right? So in November last year, the same week that my book came out, generative AI, large language models, LLM, far more complex and sophisticated, was released publicly. It's a real-time experiment that will further test our humanity. And if social media was exponential growth, generative AI is exponential, exponential. You know, as in it is beyond the scope of human comprehension. That's where social media was, right? Now, imagine double, triple, quadruple that pace of change. And what do I mean by that? Let me, you know, essentially, Large language models is just the machine being fed everything. Structured data, everything that has been written, every book, everything that they could throw into the machine, it's fed, including unstructured big data of social media. And I've already outlined that lies spread faster, right? Fear, anger, and hate. So all of that is thrown into the machine, um, which means those same patterns that I identified, well, the lies, anger, hate, they're there in that generative AI. They're there, so garbage in is garbage out. Anyway, here's what it does, right? So I'll, I'll quickly take you through that. What the large, the LLM does, that generative AI, is it takes, it can go word by word. And instead of a human mind, when you're thinking through, what word will I write next? It uses parameters, right? And the parameters are huge. GPT-1 was kind of, uneventful, right? It, there wasn't a big change because the AI was already there in search and in other things. But GPT-2 had 1.5 billion parameters. So think, I am, what's the next word? 1.5 billion parameters, GPT-2. GPT-3 went to 175 billion parameters. Do you see the you see the exponential, exponential. 1.5 to 175 billion looking through. Those are the parameters. And GPT-4, which came out this March, this is 1 trillion or up to 100 trillion parameters. This is the machine that we're dealing with. If the first generation AI was curation, what to feed you on your feed? Um, what to recommend. The next, this generative AI is creation. Have you tried it? Who's tried ChatGPT or MidJourney? Who's tried? Raise your hand. You've created, you've created, right? It's changing us. It will change us. Here's the crazy part. It still has no guardrails. Right? And the responsibility of protecting us is left in the hands of the men who will want to use it for the most profit. We, me included, are part, you know, I, I took it in the first two months. So we're, if you did this in the first two months, you're part of the 100 million that was training the large language models of ChatGPT for free. A um, hundred million of us signed up around the world. But here's the hard part. If social media weaponized our fear, anger, hate, our tribalism, what generative AI looks set to do is to manipulate the inherent loneliness that is inside each of us, right? Check out 
replica.com. Okay, here's the thing. A few months before OpenAI released ChatGPT, there was a survey. About 800 of the people on Silicon Valley took this survey, and they said, 50% of them said, that if this is released publicly, that it would lead to an extinction event of us. That was in August 2022. ChatGPT was released in November. Uh, Bard, Llama, all of the different GPT, there are thousands now that have been rolled out, right? So, yes, we are using it, and you have to use it. We are, too, in Rappler, right? Because we have to. That's part of the arms race. And we are helping them develop this. For our presidential elections last May, there were 18,000 simultaneous elections, right? We wanted to have a biography for every single person running in every one of those races. Rappler only has 10 reporters. So what we did is we took structured data and fed it to, chat to GPT-3. So that's 175 billion parameters. And the machine created almost 50,000, 49,000 pages. On every page on Rappler, it says this page was created by GP, OpenAI GPT-3 and checked by Rappler Research. Less than a month ago, Rappler began testing generative AI on our CMS, on our back end. And we began to roll it out for you, right? So you may not, we didn't announce it. We wanted to see whether or not this GP, chat GPT, this generative AI, does it, will it lie? Will it hallucinate? What are the parameters that we can put in place so that it, it's accurate, right? Because that's the first step of a news organization. If you click, if you go on Rappler, you click, there's a black button that is on top of the social sharing buttons. That generative AI will give you a three-point bullet, a three-bullet point summary of every article on Rappler. Will it work? So far it has. It's been three weeks. We thought really hard about this because it cannot be wrong, right? We can, it cannot hallucinate. So far, we narrowed the parameter so that it, it will be accurate. Um, the experiment is working. Rolling that out, even if it works, will change the way we read, right? Will you read more or read less? Um, tell us what you think. If you see an error, there's a way that let us know. And so for me, if this lies, we'll have to take it down, but so far it hasn't. How can we use the tech for good instead of to insidiously manipulate us. Okay, let me end this. I've talked about a lot of things. Um, I feel that we don't talk about the big picture enough. And we're like every other country around the world. We're focused, it's parochial to some degree, but we live in existential times and what you each do matters more than ever. Here's the other part. We are all connected. So the war is not just happening in Ukraine. Each of us are fighting our own battles for facts, for integrity. As long as you have that cell phone, you're in the battle. That connects you to the machine. So how to stand up to a dictator is the Philippine story in data. It's now translated into more than 20 languages. The European languages, Hungarian, Mongolian, there are two different Portuguese translations, one for Portugal, one for Brazil. Um, it's got Japanese, Korean, and Mandarin came out in June, and then Arabic will come out in November. I don't know why the publishers are interested, but I think it's because they are living through the same things. I wrote about the Philippine experience on data, on social media, how for six years in a row we spent the most time on the internet and on social media globally. Remember the attention economy, right? They want to keep you scrolling, but if you're not learning, if you're feeling hateful, get off, because someone is making money from you. 
What we went through in Rappler, I laid it out in data, how the corruption of our information ecosystem affected the systems of governance, how I may wind up going to jail. I wrote about my personal lessons and insights, the values that mattered, that gave me courage. I will leave you with three. I have one for every minute. The first chapter's title is The Golden Rule. It's a question I ask myself for every single decision I make. And it's how I make the first decision. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. No matter how powerful you get, whatever decision you make, the golden rule always works if you want to be a good person. The second chapter's title is The Honor Code. I went to Princeton University where we have an honor code, right? Every student coming in, it's very similar to what you have, but this one's more specific. Um, when a professor gives an exam in a class, the professor will walk out and you can actually take that exam paper and go outside and you can do, you can do it in the cafeteria, go to your room, as long as you return the paper or the test and at the bottom, you sign your honor code. You pledge on your honor that you will not cheat, but here's the other part I like best. You pledge that you will also turn in anyone you see around you who cheats. You are responsible for the world around you. I took that honor code when I took over as head of ABS-CBN and we adapted it to ABS-CBN. Their code was we will not be corrupt and I will be turning in anyone that I see who is corrupt, no matter how close they are to me. It's how we take responsibility for our world, our areas of influence. The last one is chapter three, the speed of trust. The subtitle is, be vulnerable. I'm telling you in order to be strong, you have to be vulnerable, right? Why? Because the world moves at the speed of trust and you have the best ability to get trust and to be trustworthy if you lower your shields. You are strong enough to be vulnerable. You have all the skills it takes, micro to macro, to be a hero of our insane, crazy, quicksand world. What you do matters. What you do can bring the world back from the brink. So, congratulations to the class of 2023. Join us in the battle. Be the good in the battle for the good. Thank you.